the water breaks. The woman in the movie rushes to the hospital because she knows she's in labor. And a few moments later, she gives birth. That's not really how it works. It's actually much longer than that. Grab a piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at normal labor. We're just going to be looking at the process of labor. In another video, I'm going to look at the management of normal labor before we set the preliminary to actually have a look at abnormalities in labor, how to identify them, and what to do. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. Tell a friend to tell a friend that we are doing lectures on the channel to Zambia and beyond. Let's go. Here's a warm-up question, which is a single best answer. A very long one. A 30-year-old G1 para 0 with a twin gestation at 25 weeks presents to labor and delivery complaining of irregular uterine contractions and back pain. She reports an increase in the amount of her vaginal discharge, but denies any rupture of membranes. She reports that earlier in the day, she had some very light vaginal bleeding, which has now resolved. She says that the babies have been active and moving as much as usual. She thinks that she may be feeling cramping because she may have overdone it with too much activity and lifting as she is trying to fix up the nursery to get it ready for the babies. She denies any change in her bowel or urine habits. She reports having had regular prenatal care during the pregnancy and denies any prior problems or complications. On arrival at the labor and delivery ward, she is placed on an external fetal monitor, which indicates uterine contractions every two to four minutes. She is a febrile and her vital signs are all normal. Her gravid uterus is non-tender. The nurse calls you to evaluate the patient. All of the following are appropriate next steps in the evaluation of this patient except... A, sterile digital examination, B, intravenous hydration, C, bedside ultrasound, D, urinalysis and urine culture, E, rectal vaginal swab for beta streptococcus or group B streptococcus rather. Write down your answer on what you think this may be. I will give you the answer at the end of the lecture. So when you talk about labor, this is just simply the process where you have these regular uterine contractions that bring about progressive changes in the cervix. And what are these progressive changes? Effacement, which is thinning and shortening of the cervix, dilatation of the cervix, fetal descent that results in delivery of the fetus and expulsion of the placental and fetal membranes. That's the definition of labor. If you want a shorter definition, it's just a series of rhythmic, involuntary, or medically induced contractions of the uterus that result in effacement, which is shortening and thinning, and dilatation of the cervix. Remember that labor does not mean the same thing as delivery. They're not synonymous. Delivery can actually take place without labor. For example, in an elective C-section, delivery can either be vaginal, spontaneous, or aided, or it can be abdominal. This is just simply removal extraction of the fetus from the uterus. So delivery is just expulsion or extraction of a viable fetus out of the womb. So a, a woman that's actually in labor is known as a parturient. And the process of labor or the process of giving birth is known as parturition. Remember that in normal labor, there should be about three to five contractions in 10 minutes. And each contraction must last about 40 to 60 seconds. According to the WHO, what we refer to as normal labor or eutocia, dystocia is abnormal labor, eutocia is normal labor. It should fit these criteria. 
Number one, the birth should be spontaneous and it should be low risk at the start throughout the entire labor and throughout delivery. It should remain low risk. There should be no undue prolongation of the labor. The infant must be born spontaneously with a vertex position or a vertex presentation. It must occur at term, so between 37 weeks and 42 weeks of pregnancy. And it should naturally terminate without minimal aids. People actually do even give birth outside the hospital and they actually do have normal labors. And after the child is born, both the mother, the infant must remain in good condition. When you take all these boxes, then you consider that as normal labor. So remember that labor usually begins two weeks before or two weeks after the estimated date of delivery. If it's a first pregnancy, it lasts longer. So it lasts about 12 to 18 hours on an average. Subsequent labors or in multiparous women, labor is much shorter, so it lasts about six to eight hours. And remember that labor may occur prior to the 37 completed weeks. You call that as preterm labor. If you get expulsion of pre-viable live fetus, which occurs through the same process in a miniature form, we call that as mini labor. Then abnormal labor or dystocia, anything that is deviating from all those criteria that I showed you on the previous slide, according to the WHO, then we call that as dystocia. For example, if a child is not in vertex position, we call that as abnormal labor, in, in essence. And then if they are having any other complications or anything that can modify the natural termination of the labor or any adverse effect to the mother or to the fetus, we refer to this as abnormal labor. Remember that the exact date of delivery is actually quite difficult to predict, but we can actually use Nagel's formula or Nagel's rule to estimate the date of delivery. Comment below in the section below about Nagel's rule. And remember that based on the formula, labor is going to be starting approximately about on the expected date in about 4% of the cases. One week on either side, meaning one week before, one week after in 50% of the cases. Two weeks earlier and one week later or two weeks earlier or one week later in 80% of the cases, most of the cases. And at 42 weeks in 10% and 43 weeks in 4%. So you can see that the bulk majority are either occurring two weeks before or one week after the expected date of delivery. What exactly causes labor? We don't really know the exact stimulus that may trigger labor, but there are some things that have been implicated. Digital manipulation or mechanical stretching of the cervix, for example, during examinations, this actually enhances uterine contractions, most likely due to the effect of the release of oxytocin from the posterior pituitary gland. We also do have some endocrine, biochemical, and mechanical stretch pathways that have been hypothesized. Uterine distension is another thing that has been implicated. This actually explains why labor actually happens earlier in pregnancies where you have twin pregnancies as well as pregnancies associated with polyhydramnios. When you have over distension of the uterus, you have stretching, a stretching effect on the myometrium. And this is, of course, as a result of the growing fetus or the liqua that is a lot. And this actually increases the gap junction proteins. It increases the number of receptors on the fundus for oxytocin and also the production of these specific contract, contraction associated protein or caps. And this actually does explain the labor in these twin pregnancies and polyhydramnios. So what exactly is the mechanism here? So I just want to take some time here because this tends to confuse a lot of people. So remember that the fetus that's inside the uterus has a pituitary gland. It has adrenal glands. We call this as the fetal hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. The mother also has a hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, but I'm talking about the fetus. So prior to labor, the pituitary adrenal axis is actually activated. So the hypothalamus is going to be producing your corticotrophin releasing hormone. And this corticotrophin releasing hormone is going to be acting on the pituitary gland to produce ACTH, which is your adrenal corticotrophic hormone. So once ACTH has been produced, this ACTH will now stimulate the fetal adrenal glands to produce cortisol. And the cortisol now is going to stimulate the production of estrogen and prostaglandins from the placenta. These have specific effects in labor. So the estrogen that is produced is going to increase the release of oxytocin from the mother's posterior pituitary gland. 
it's also going to stimulate the synthesis of the oxytocin receptors on the fundus by about 100 and 200 fold such that the uterus will now have more oxytocin receptors and remember that it also increases the production of prostaglandins it also increases the gap junctions in the myometrial cells of the uterus remember that the gap junctions is, is what allows this uterus to contract as a syncytium to contract as a whole then the estrogen is also going to be accelerating the lysosomal degradation or de disintegration of the decidual and amniotic cells and this results in increase in production of prostaglandins specifically prostaglandin 2 alpha f2 alpha then it's also going to stimulate the synthesis of the myometrial contractile proteins the Act, the actin and the myosin through the uh, cyclic adenosine monophosphate pathway and there's also going to be increase in excitability of the myometrial cells so all these effects are from estrogen that is being produced as a result of the cortisol that is flooding from the fetal adrenal glands into the maternal system affecting the placenta then another thing that's going to be produced is your prostaglandins remember that your prostaglandins are going to be produced pretty much via the enzyme the phospholipase a2 enzymes so phospholipase a2 is present in the lysosomes of the fetal membrane and near term this is actually going to catalyze the conversion of these free fatty acids into of course free arachidonic acid so once you have this arachidonic acid it actually can be used to enter into the cyclooxygenase pathway catalyzed by various enzymes one of which is the prostaglandin synthetase enzyme which produces two important prostaglandins that i want you to know which is prostaglandin e2 and prostaglandin f2 alpha so these prostaglandins are actually going to diffuse into the myometrium they're going to be acting on the cycloplasmic reticulum they inhibit the intracellular cyclic adenosine monophosphate generation they increase the amount of calcium that is present in the muscles so this is going to be causing contractions and the prostaglandin synthesis actually reaches peak during birth of the placenta and probably this actually contributes to the expulsion and the control of the postpartum hemorrhage remember that prostaglandin synthesis is triggered by a rise in the estrogen levels glucocorticoids mechanical stretching that is seen in latent pregnancy it also can be stimulated by the cytokines interleukin 1 interleukin 6 tumor necrosis factor infections vaginal examination separation of or rupture of the membranes also do contribute to the synthesis of prostaglandins and these prostaglandins are synthesized mainly from the amnion the chorion the decidua and the myometrium this actually have been implicated in the initiation and the maintenance of labor Remember also that you have progesterone, which is a hormone that maintains pregnancy. It inhibits uterine contractions and the levels of progesterone must fall such that the ratio now of estrogen to progesterone must change. This changes in the ratio is actually what causes labor. People think that it's just the fall of progesterone that causes labor, but that's not true. It's actually the changes in the ratio of estrogen to progesterone that actually triggers labor. It triggers the synthesis of prostaglandins so remember that inside the, the the fetus now the fetus is going to be producing a lot of cortisol now increased production of cortisol as well as increased production of dehydroepiandrosterone -epi sulfate is pretty much going to be inhibiting the conversion of fetopregnenolone to progesterone so this is what actually decreases the production of progesterone here's a schematic to help you understand everything i know words sometimes could mean so many things but diagrams i love diagrams so here the fetus the hypothalamus produces this corticotrophin releasing hormone which stimulates the fetal pituitary gland this fetal pituitary gland produces adrenal corticotrophic hormone this stimulates the adrenal glands to produce cortisol and dehydroepiandrostenone sulfate these are going to stimulate estrogen to be produced from the placenta and estrogen is going to be stimulating of course the production of the oxytocin from the maternal pituitary gland and then oxytocin remember oxytocin is produced from the hypothalamus and released from the posterior pituitary gland this oxytocin will increase the myometrial receptors 
the oxytocin receptors and the prostaglandin receptors. It will increase the gap junctions. It will increase the amount of prostaglandin synthesis. That's the prostaglandin F2 alpha from the decidua. It also increases the stretch receptor number and sensitivity. In addition to this, there is also an increase in interleukins like 1, 6, and 8, increase in prostaglandins, and the dihydroepiandrostinone sulfate is pretty much going to be also inhibiting the conversion of fetopregnenolone into progesterone. So the levels of progesterone fall, the ratio between estrogen and progesterone is disturbed, and this actually triggers labor. This leads to the uterine contractions and eventually labor. I hope that makes a lot of sense. Remember that the fundus has a large number of oxytocin receptors compared to the lower segment of the uterus as well as the cervix and the receptor number actually increases as pregnancy reaches its maximum uh, term then the oxytocin receptor sensitivity is actually going to be increased during labor so this is actually as a result of certain things it's as a result of the synthesis and the release of or the oxytocin rather synthesizes and stimulates the synthesis and release of prostaglandins that's prostaglandin e2 and prostaglandin f2 alpha from the amnion and the decidua then remember that vaginal examinations amniotomy can also rise the maternal plasma levels of oxytocin we call this as the ferguson reflex here's another possible schematic of the possible mechanism of initiation of labor so remember that you have activation of the fetal hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis which eventually produces cortisol. The cortisol that has been produced stimulates the placenta to produce a lot of estrogen and decreases the production of progesterone or prostaglandins. There's an alteration in the balance between estrogen and progesterone. This results in, of course, increase in synthesis of oxytocin, increase in synthesis of prostaglandin 2 and F2 alpha, prostaglandin E2 and F2 alpha. There's increase in production of contraction associated proteins. There's increase in uh, of course nitric oxide this also is going to be causing activation of the myometrial contractile system and remember that the prostaglandin e2 and f2 alpha are produced from the placenta amnion chorion and decidua in addition to this the estrogen also stimulates the posterior pituitary gland of the mother to release oxytocin which also triggers the same things that i've been talking about there are some other things also that do stimulate labor the adrenergic system. So remember that the uterus consists of receptors, adrenergic receptors. It has alpha receptors and it has beta receptors. These receptors react in a similar manner to how receptors in all different types of smooth muscles actually react. So the alpha receptors will cause contraction. The beta receptors, once they are stimulated, it will cause relaxation of the uterus. So remember when you stimulate the alpha receptors, you stimulate a, a, a stimulatory um, type of mechanism with associated G proteins, which results in increase in, of course, the CAMP. This results in phosphorylation of myosin light chain kinase, rather inhibits the, the, the phosphorylation of myosin light chain kinase. And this actually leads to the uterus relaxing. That's with the alpha receptors. So when alpha receptors are stimulated this will lead to contraction i don't know if i messed that up just now but it will lead to contractions if beta receptors are stimulated this will lead to relaxation so the estrogen causes the alpha receptors progesterone causes beta receptors to function predominantly so remember that with alpha receptor stimulation there's a decrease in camp results in the contraction of the uterus myosin light chain kinase is dephosphorylated and this results in the, them becoming active. So the dephosphorylated myosin light chain kinase will become active. And it will phosphorylate the myosin light chains, which leads to contractions. Then the beta receptors here, once they are stimulated, this results in increase in CAMP. This results in phosphorylation and inhibition of the myosin light chain kinase, which can no longer phosphorylate the myosin light chains. And this inhibits the uterine contractions. I hope this makes sense. If it doesn't, then you need to revise your pharmacology. So what are the types of pain that we see in labor? So there are two main types. We have false labor pain 
and we have true labor pain. But during pregnancy, you may have these painless Braxton Hicks contractions, which we call as practice contractions. There is simultaneous hardening of the uterus that can actually even occur. So these contractions actually do change their character. They become more painful. They may become intermittent and associated with pain. So the pains are often felt in front of the abdomen and they radiate towards the thigh. These are just practice contractions throughout the pregnancy. So what about false pains or false labor? So this is also referred to as spurious labor or false labor. So this is much more common in the prima gravida than the Paris women. And usually it appears prior to the onset of true labor pain by about one to two weeks in prime gravidis and a few days in multiparous women. That's why sometimes people that are prime gravidis, they may not even know that they're in labor because they may have had these false pains like one or two weeks before, then they actually become true labor pains and they think that it's part of the normal process of pregnancy and they may not know that they're in labor. Then... The pain is probably thought to be due to stretching of the cervix and the lower uterine segment, and this also results in irritation of the neighboring ganglia. That's what causes the pain. So this type of pain is going to be characterized by being dull in nature. It's confined to the low abdomen and the groin. It's not associated with hardening of the uterus. It's not associated with any other features of true labor. It's going to be relieved by an enema. Then true labor pains here are going to be characterized by regular uterine contractions and the frequency of contractions actually increases gradually. The intensity and the dilatation of the cervix is also going to be seen and there's going to be descent of the presenting part. There may be formation of the bags of four waters. So what do I mean by this? So remember that as the pregnancy is moving further and further towards term, you have this stretching that is happening in the lower uterine segment. The membranes actually become easily detached from the from their adherent, the poorly adherent decidua in the lower segment, such that when you have dilatation of the cervix, the lower pole of the fetal membrane actually becomes unsupported and it will bulge out into the cervical canal, which is what we refer to as the bags of water, because it's going to be containing liqua, which has passed just below the presenting part. So we call this as bags of water. So when the uterus contracts, the bag becomes tense because the intra amniotic pressure has increased and it becomes convex but then when the contraction passes out it completely disappears so this is actually an almost certain sign that labor has actually begun in these patients and remember that this type of pain is not relieved by enema or sedatives so how do we distinguish between the two false labor occurs at irregular intervals it may be braxton hicks contractions true labor occurs at regular intervals that tend to shorten the intensity is the same with the forced labor. The intensity increases with true labor. Discomfort is in the lower abdomen with forced labor. It's in the back and the lower abdomen in true labor. There are no cervical changes in forced labor. There is cervical dilatation in true labor. Forced labor is relieved by medication. True labor may not be necessarily relieved by the usual medication. Now, let's go into the process of labor. So what happens at the beginning of labor? So you have the rupture of the chorionic membranes or bloody show. These are the diagnostic things that labor has started. Remember that bloody show is just a small amount of blood with mucus from the cervix. This may actually precede labor by even as much as three days. So the bloody show must be differentiated from the, abdom the abnormal third trimester uh, bleeding. Remember that you may sometimes have third trimester bleeding that you may think that this is bloody show but not really bloody show is not really should it increase in amount it should be small amounts the, the amount is small and often it's mixed with mucus so there is no pain that's going to be associated with placenta abruption which is premature separation of the placenta we don't have that so if an ultrasound wasn't done during antenatal please do an ultrasound to rule out a placenta previa if there's any vaginal bleeding that's going to be occurring because if there is bleeding placenta previa is always assumed until we rule it out so it means that you should avoid doing any digital vaginal examination until you can actually get an ultrasound for this patient and until placenta abruption can be ruled out for this patient and you can actually determine the location of the placenta then Labor actually begins with uh, irregular uterine contractions or varying intensities that are going to apparently soften the cervix. 
which then begins to efface and then it will begin to dilate. And then as the labor is going to be progressing, the contractions actually increase in duration, they increase in intensity, and they increase in frequency. In the diagnosis of the rupture of membranes, the patient history is very important and it's actually quite correct in 90% of the cases. And urine leakage or even excess vaginal fluid can sometimes be mistaken for rupture of membranes. So when they come in and they're in labor, you want to actually perform a sterile speculum examination, not a digital examination, a sterile speculum examination. So you're going to see that there's pooling, that's the presence of fluid collection in the posterior fornix. I think I talked about this with my premature rupture of membrane video. Then the valsalva maneuver, you can ask them to perform that and you'll be able to note the lycra coming out from the cervix. Then there may be a fanning pattern on the layer of the glass slide where you smear this fluid on when you look at it in the microscope. This is an image here. So this confirms rupture of membranes at about 85 to 98 percent. An ultrasound is often going to be showing oligohydramnios if there has been rupture of membranes and it has been there for quite some time. You may sometimes perform an amniocentesis with installation of a dye. This actually does confirm rupture of membranes and even it you can detect the dye in the vagina or in a tampon that this can actually confirm that the, the membranes have actually ruptured then you can perform a nitrazine test so the nitrazine paper actually turns blue from yellow and this is going to be indicating a positive nitrazine test because this means that the ph has increased remember that the vaginal ph is acidic then amniotic fluid being present in the vagina would make it more alkalinic, so it would change the nitrogen paper into a dark blue color. But remember, other things like vaginal infections with trichomonas vaginalis, blood, semen, can actually cause a false positive nitrogen test. So these things are going to be used now to confirm that labor indeed has started. So the presence of meconium in the amniotic fluid is going to be an indication of fetal distress, so you may remain vigilant and actually expedite the labor. And then... The meconium staining is actually more common in the term and post-term pregnancies than it is in pre-term pregnancies. So what happens in pre-labor, which is the premonitory stage? So this actually begins about two to three weeks before the onset of true labor in prime gravidus, and then in multiparous women, it may be a few days. The features are actually inconsistent, but you may have certain things. So one thing that you may actually have is what's known as lightening. Not lightening as in lightning and thunder, no. It's a different type of lightening. So a few weeks prior to actually the onset of labor, especially in primigravida patients, we have the presenting part, which is normally in most of the uh, individuals, the head, sinking into the true pelvis. So when it sinks into the true pelvis, remember that this is going to be due to the pooling up of the upper pose around the presenting part and this is going to be signifying incorporation of the lower uterine segment into the walls of the rest of the uterus so this actually causes the fundus of the uterus to diminish in size and such that now the pressure that the uterus was having on the diaphragm and causing some discomfort in breathing to the mother this is going to cause now some sense of relief because the diaphragm has now moved lower so this relief from this mechanical cardiorespiratory embarrassment actually is what we're or this movement or sinking of the presenting part into the true pelvis of the mother is what we call as our lightening so this is actually a very welcoming sign and it's a sign that uh, cephalopelvic disproportion is less likely and other conditions that may present or prevent the head from entering into the uh, pelvic inlet are less likely so you may also have some cervical changes a few days prior to the onset of labor, the cervix may actually ripen. So the cervix becomes soft the, and less than 1.5 centimeters in length. It can actually even admit one finger easily and it's dilatable. Then you also have appearance of false pains, which I talked about, and rupture of the membranes or history of draining, which is the breaking of the waters. So this is what lightening is all about. As you can see, here is the brim. And this is in before lightening. You can see that there is some pressure on the diaphragm. And then when it lightens, the fundus goes down and the presenting part enters into the true maternal pelvis. Then you get this feeling of relief. Cardiorespiratory embarrassment that was there is relieved. Then with the onset of labor, there's going to be this profuse cervical secretion and a slight ooze of blood, which is as a result of the rupture of the capillary vessels of the cervix and also from the raw decidual surface. So this is caused by separation of the membranes because the lower uterine segment is stretching out. So this is what you refer to as shore. 
which I already talked about, this little blood and sometimes mixed with mucus. So the duration of labor is shorter in multiparous women, I already mentioned this, than in nulliparous women. The rule of thumb is this, no woman should actually see two sunrise or two sunsets in labor. So labor usually normally happens when the pregnancy is at term after 37 weeks and at term the fetus is going to be dropping lower into the uterus because it becomes rather heavy, it pushes on the cervix and this actually can stimulate the uterine contractions, it can also stimulate the cervical dilatation, it can stimulate effacement or thinning of the cervix. So remember that there is also another hormone that is going to be produced which is known as relaxin. Relaxin just loosens the pelvic ligaments so that the pelvic ligaments and the bones can come apart to support the enlarging uterus. It also opens the pelvic inlet by loosening the, the pubic symphysis. It can also cause dilatation of the cervix during labor. Now, the relaxations are quite important because they, they have to accommodate the growing fetus and they make the pelvic outlet larger and easier for the baby to actually pass through during labor. So now what are the stages of labor? So typically there are three main stages. Some books will give you four stages and I will discuss four stages here. So three main stages in most literature, four stages in this lecture that I'm about to give you. The first stage is known as the cervical stage. So pretty much it prepares the cervix for labor. The second stage is the, the delivery, where the delivery is going to be happening. So it's divided into a propulsive phase and an expulsive phase. Then the third stage is actually the delivery of the afterbirth. Then the fourth stage is an observational stage. So the first stage is the cervical stage, which pretty much starts from the onset of the true labor pains to the end of full dilatation of the cervix. So the cervix is termed fully dilated if it is about 10 centimeters in diameter. So it's divided into a latent phase, which is the first phase of the stage one, and an active phase, which is the second stage of phase one. Then you have stage two. This starts from the fully dilated cervix, that's 10 centimeters, not from the rupture of membrane. Some people think that when the membrane rupture, that's when stage two has started. No, it actually starts from when the cervix is fully dilated. So in some cases, the membrane may not even have ruptured and this person may actually even be in stage two. So if the, you realize that, okay, they are delaying, especially in the active phase of labor, when you have already opened the pathograph, then you can actually rupture the membranes. So it may be a propulsive phase and an expulsive phase. Then stage three here from the expulsion of the fetus and it ends in the expulsion of the placenta and the membranes, pretty much the afterbirths. Then stage four is just the stage of observation, which is at least one hour after the expulsion of the afterbirth. This just monitors the woman to see if she's okay and to see if she's not excessively bleeding because most women actually do bleed even at this stage. So we'll begin with the stage one. So this just prepares the birth canal and facilitates so as to facilitate the expulsion of the fetus in the second stage. So in stage one, there's a cervical stage, which is pretty much cervical dilatation and effacement. So like I said, it's from the onset of true labor pain. Remember, true labor pain is going to be characterized by regular uterine contractions with sufficient frequency, sufficient intensity and duration to this full dilatation and effacement, complete effacement of the cervix. So this takes about 12 hours in prime gravidus. It takes about six hours in multiparous women. So remember the, here that the oxytocin that's coming from the posterior pituitary gland is going to be causing uterine contractions. And then these contractions cause the membranes around the fetus to release prostaglandins, which help in softening the cervix and they cause stronger contractions, which then release more prostaglandin. So we call this as a positive feedback loop. So this, posit this is a, an example of positive feedback loop in labor. Then as the cervix dilates, the mucus plug actually is going to come out. There may be a discharge, a, a, a bloody show, and this may happen some days before the labor, and then also the amniotic sac also ruptures, so there's a, a breaking of the waters. So the stage one is divided into a latent phase and an active phase. So remember that at the beginning of the latent phase, the contractions usually occur about 5 to 30 minutes apart, and they last about 30 seconds. Then this causes the cervix to dilate from about zero centimeters to about three centimeters and then we face about zero to 30 percent then you get these regular contractions which happen three to five mi minutes apart and each of them lasting one minute sometimes even longer than one minute and this causes the cervix to dilate roughly from three centimeters to about four centimeters and it the cervix effaces about 80 percent 
then you enter into the active phase. So then in the active phase, the cervix actually dilates from 4 centimeters to 10 centimeters, and it completely effaces. So the contractions now here become very intense. They last about 60 to 90 seconds, each of them only about 30 seconds, sometimes even two minutes apart, and you resting in between. So sometimes the contractions may actually even overlap each other, such that there is no rest in between. No rest for the wicked indeed. <laughs> I'm only joking. So the amniotic sac ruptures at this point if it hasn't ruptured. And standing and walking actually can shorten this first stage of labor by more than one hour actually. And it reduces the rate of cesarean section deliveries. So during the first stage of labor, the maternal heart rate, the blood pressure, the fetal rate should be checked continuously by either electronic monitoring or intermittent auscultation. And usually this can be done with a portable Doppler ultrasound device. So the woman may actually begin the, to feel the urge to bear down and as the presenting part is descending into the pelvis, but discourage her from doing this in the first stage because she will get tired and she's wasting energy. She might actually even tear the cervix because it's not yet completely ready. It's not yet fully dilated. So we'll begin with the latent phase. Remember stage one is divided into a latent phase and an active phase. So the latent phase begins from regular uterine contractions and ends with acceleration of the cervical dilatation so from not dilated where you have re regular uterine contractions to when it is four centimeters dilated so the purpose of this is to prepare the cervix for rapid dilatation as well as effacement so the cervix dilates from zero to four centimeters remember the pathograph has not yet been opened at this stage so essentially there is no descent of the fetus that's going to be occurring and the latent phase is difficult to time precisely and it varies greatly among many individuals in primary gravidus, it's between 8 to 10 hours long, but the upper limit can even be up to 20 hours. If it's more than 20 hours in prime gravidus, we say that that's a prolonged latent phase. Then in multiparous women, it's between 5 to 6 hours. If it's more than 14 hours, we say that that's prolonged latent phase. Some literature actually use a threshold of 12 hours. Then we get into the active phase. So this is the cervical dilatation acceleration where it dilates very quickly. So from 4 centimeters to 10 centimeters, which is fully dilated. And then the presenting part actually descends well into the mid pelvis of the mother. So the purpose of this is for rapid cervical dilatation. And the fetal descent actually begins when the cervix is actually around 7 to 8 centimeters dilated in nulliparous women. And about 8 centimeters dilated in, and then becomes much more rapid in, eight centimeters dilatation so here you may have some cardinal movements of labor occurring with of course the descent of the fetus i'll talk about them in details when we come to the second stage of labor but don't forget that the descent actually starts in the active phase of labor at the end of the active phase of labor so the rate of dilatation is at least one 1.2 centimeters per hour in primiparous women. It's much faster in multiparous women, so about 1.5 centimeters per hour in multiparous women. But recent studies show that there is a slower progression of cervical dilatation from 4 and 6 centimeters, and this may actually be normal. So on an average, the active phase is going to be lasting 5 to 7 hours in nulliparous women and about 2 to 4 hours in multiparous women. Then in the active phase of labor remember that pelvic examinations are going to be done every two to three hours to evaluate the progress of labor and lack of progress in the dilatation and uh, cervical dis uh, in dilatation and fetal descent of the presenting part is going to be indicating fetal dystocia it could be a fetal pelvic disproportion so remember that we do open the pathograph in the active phase of labor when the cervix is four centimeters dilated. So if the membranes have not spontaneously ruptured, the clinician may actually sweep the membranes and they may actually perform a routine rupture of the membranes. Remember that rupture of the membranes should be avoided in women that have HIV. It should be avoided in women with hepatitis B and C so as to not expose the infant to these conditions. Then abnormalities in the active phase of labor include a prolonged active phase of labor and even an arrest of the active phase of labor. So if the progress is actually delayed or slowed down as compared to the above rates that I've talked about in the previous slide, consider three things. The three Ps. The power, maybe the strength and the frequency of the contractions is not enough. You can actually aid this by giving oxytocin. The passenger, maybe the fetal attitude 
not really the, the mood of the baby, but I'll talk about at, what attitude is very shortly. The fetal size, maybe the head is too big. The presentation, maybe the fetus is not in vertex presentation, or is maybe the fetus is in breech presentation, and the lie of the baby. That's the longitudinal axis of the baby in relation to the longitudinal axis of the mother. Then sometimes it could be the, the passage of the pelvis, the size and the shape of the mother's pelvis. We'll look at all these abnormalities in different lectures. So remember that the relationship between the baby's head and the bony pelvis at this point is very critical. So the human skull actually, the, the skull bones are not really fused and they can actually cross over each other. They can actually adjust such that the baby can successfully and safely move through the birth canal into the world. So I want to just explain a few terms that I will use in the next subsequent lecture. One term that I want to explain is fetal attitude. Another term is fetal lie. Another term is fetal presentation or the presenting part, which I've already alluded to a, a, lit, a little bit earlier on, but I haven't really explained. So we'll begin with fetal attitude. So this affects labor. So remember that attitude is just simply the way that the fetal body is flexed. It's not the personality of the fetus. It's the way the fetal body is flexed. So when the labor starts, the fetus is normally fully flexed. So it means that the chin will be on the chest, the the back will be rounded, the arms will be flexed, the, the legs will be flexed, the fetal position, quote unquote. So in this position, you have the smallest diameter, which is the suboccipital pragmatic diameter, which is going to be presenting to the pelvic inlet. So in larger fetuses and those that are not completely flexed, labor actually is actually very, very difficult in these cases. Then fetal lie here also does affect labor. So it's just pretty much the position of the fetus in the uterus in relation to the maternal axis. So you can have a longitudinal fetal lie, which is the ideal lie. So where the long axis of the fetus, which is its spine, is in line with the long axis of the mother, the mother's spine. Some other abnormal lies include a transverse lie. You may sometimes have where the fetus, fetal spine is perpendicular to the mother's spine. You may also have oblique weights at oblique rather weights at a certain angle. So the two positions can actually impede the progress of labor. Then with fetal presentation, this is just the first part of the fetus that is presenting. Cephalic presentation or herd first is the most common type. And optimal presentation for easy delivery is a type of cephalic presentation, which is known as a vertex presentation, where there's complete flexion of the head as well. You may sometimes have breech presentation where the head is in the fundus and the bottoms or the buttocks of the child are the ones that are presenting. Sometimes a feet, sometimes a knee can present first. Sometimes even a shoulder presents first. So these actually make it quite difficult in labor. Then we'll move now to the second stage of labor, which is the expulsion of the baby. So here this starts from full cervical dilatation till the fetus is expelled from the birth canal. So it lasts about two hours in premier gravida women, an average of about 50 minutes, 30 minutes, 30 to 60 minutes in multiparous women with an average of about 20 minutes. So it may last another hour or more if we conduct an epidural an analgesia or if we have given this woman intense opioids. So it has two phases, a propulsive phase, which starts from 10 centimeter dilated up to the descent of the presenting part to the pelvic floor. Then the expulsive phase, which is distinguished by the maternal bearing down efforts, and it ends in delivery of the baby. So the purpose of this is for the descended fetus to descend through the birth canal as the mother also pushes and augments the uterine contractions. So for the spontaneous delivery, the woman actually must supplement the uterine contraction with bearing down. This is where you actually ask the mother to bear down. So in the second stage, Women should be attended to constantly. The fetal heart rate should be monitored continuously or should be checked after every contraction. And remember, you have in this uh, area here, you're going to be monitoring by palpation, but you can also do it electronically. So during the second stage, there are some people that actually perform perineal massages with lubricants, warm compressors that may actually soften and stretch out the perineum. This actually reduces the rates of third and fourth degree perineal tears. So these have actually been used by many midwives and birth attendants worldwide in hospitals and even outside. So during this second stage of labor, in contrast to the first stage, the mother's position is not going to affect the duration. So walking around will not help. Certain positions will not help. So the maternal or neonatal outcome in the 
uh, deliveries without epidural anesthesia, the, the time doesn't change. Whatever the mother does, the time doesn't change. So the pushing technique, spontaneous versus directed or directed and delayed versus immediate, does also not affect the mode of delivery or the maternal or the neonatal outcome. So the use of epidural analgesia or anesthesia, he actually delays the pushing and may actually lengthen the second stage by at least an hour. So there are some cardinal movements that happen that I say that will come to. So these actually make it easy for the fetus to pass through the birth canal. There are just several positions which the fetus takes as they are passing through the birth canal. So there are seven cardinal movements. Engagement, descent, flexion, internal, rota internal rotation, extension, external rotation or restitution, and expulsion. So there's a mnemonic that I want you to learn. Every darn fetus is extremely eager to exit. Forget the two here. So engagement, descent, flexion, internal rotation, extension, external rotation or restitution, and expulsion. So in engagement, we have pretty much the descent of the bipareto diameter, which is the largest diameter on the head, about 9.5 centimeters through the plane of the pelvic inlet. So this can occur late in pregnancy or it can occur in labor. So clinically, if the presenting part is actually at the level of the ischiospine of the mother, then we say that the presenting part is at zero station. So the head is thought to be engaged in the pelvis. And remember that the engagement is determined by the palpation of the presenting part of the occiput and the fundal height decreases a term because of engagement. So here, and one here, we have the head floating before it's engaged. And then we can see that here there is engagement that's happening, leading to descent and flexion. So the next is descent. So this occurs when the fetal head actually passes down into the pelvis. So it occurs in a discontinuous fashion. Remember, it starts off in the late active phase of stage one when you're about eight centimeters uh, or towards the full dilatation. So the greatest rate of descent is in the deceleration phase of the first stage and during the second stage of labor. So the initial, initially there's going to be some descent which is a downward movement of the fetus into the pelvic inlet and of course the degree of descent is called the fetal station. So it's described in terms or in relation to the maternal's ischiospine. So if the fetus or the presenting part is at the ischiospine, we call that station as zero. You give a minus if it's above, a positive value if it's below. Then we have flexion, which is what is happening here as well. So here the chin is brought close to the uh, fetal thorax and there is a, a passive motion that facilitates the present the presentation of the smallest part of the possible diameter of the fetal head into the birth canal. As we can see here, the smallest part is the one that presents first. Then we have internal rotation that is going to be taking place, which is what's happening here at uh, part three here. So here the, the fetal shoulder is actually going to be rotating about 45 degrees so that the widest part of the fetal uh, shoulders are in line with the widest part of the pelvic of the mother. So this is just turning of the head that moves the occiput gradually towards the pubic symphysis and less commonly it can be moved towards the hollow part of the sacrum. Then you have of course your extension that's happening there. So here you have complete rotation that has been happening in the beginning of extension. As you can see that the this occiput that was just underneath the pubic symphysis now the head begins to extend like that. So the fetal head here passes beneath this, the pubic symphysis, there would be at the station plus four. Then there is extension, which is going to be happening as the fetal head changes from the flexion to the extension position. So they move into the uh, station five and they emerge from the vagina. So here the, the occiput moves towards the fetal's uh, back. Then of course this occurs as the fetus descends at the level of the maternal valva. So this action, brings about the occiput in contact with, of course, the inferior margin of the pubic symphysis, where the birth canal actually curves upwards. Then the delivery of the fetal head is actually going to be occurring when there is changes from the flexed to the extended position, and it curves under and passes the pubic symphysis, which is what's happening here at diagram number five. 
And then you have the external rotation or restitution, which occurs after the delivery of the head when the fetus actually resumes its normal face forward position with the occiput actually and the spine lying in the same plane. Then the shoulder of the the anterior shoulder of the fetus actually is behind the pubic symphysis at this point and the other one is the uh, posterior shoulder it's it's actually lagging a bit behind so the fetus here then rotates to face the thighs of the mother so there's some rotation to face the thighs of the mother then afterwards there's some expulsion that happens where the anterior shoulder now slips underneath the pubic symphysis and the rest of the body actually follows the posterior shoulder and the rest of the body follows and then this will be the end of the second stage of labor then we Remember that once the head of the baby crowns, it becomes visible to the practitioner. You, you can actually turn the head of the baby to the side to make the delivery much easier for this woman. So when the baby is actually out, the umbilical cord can be cut and the baby is cleaned. And in most cases, the baby's head comes out first, which is a vertex presentation. If in other cases, about 5%, Anything else comes out first, the buttocks, you call this as a breech presentation, this carries a higher risk of caesarean delivery. Then abnormalities include a prolonged second stage or arrest of the descent. So remember that anything less than one centimeter in naliparous women or less than two centimeters in multiparous women is called as a prolonged stage of labor. Two centimeters descent per hour or one centimeter descent per hour. Then we move now to the stage three. So this is begins after you have now delivered the fetus and it ends with expulsion of the placental or fetal membranes, the afterbirth. So remember that the placental separation from the uterus wall occurs when you have these contractions of the myometrium and this causes this, the sharing off of the anchoring villi. And this can be augmented with in, infusion of the oxytocin. Actually, after the delivery of the anterior shoulder, if you are performing active management of thirds, stage of labor and you assume that or you actually not even assume you check that there isn't a second twin you can administer oxytocin your 10 international units so there are some signs that signify that the placenta has detached gush of blood vaginally then you may have the fundus of the uterus rising up and becoming firm and then of course there is changes of the uterus from long to it becoming globular then the lengthening of the umbilical cord so the duration of the third stage should be about 30 minutes in in all women and usually less than, it lasts less than 10 to 15 minutes. And the duration is actually reduced to five minutes in active management of labor. So abnormal, uh, manage, uh, abnormal third stage of labor includes prolonged third stage of labor. If it's lasting longer than 30 minutes, then you have to remove it manually. So here we have strict policies that actually prevent this mother from bleeding out. So we call this as active management of third stage of labor or AMSTIL. So remember that delivery of placenta can happen physiologically, which we call is expectant. There's a higher risk of PPH or active management where um, you actually reduce the risk of PPH. So what is active management of the third stage of labor? So here we want to excite the powerful uterine contractions within one minute of the delivery of the baby. So we want to give parenteral oxytocin, which facilitates the early separation of the placenta as well as the effective uterine contractions. So we can give 10 international units on the thigh or 0 0.2 milligrams IM on the thigh. Avoid this in hypertensive patients within one minute of delivery of the baby. So if the placenta is expected to be delivered soon, following the delivery of the baby, we can deliver it. So if the placenta is not delivered thereafter, it should be delivered with controlled cord traction, what we call as the brand Andrew technique. So after clamping of the cord, while the uterus remains contracted, you can actually make up and down motions and do not pull on the placenta. You should also apply some, some support to the perineum. Then if this is the first attempt and it has failed, another attempt is going to be made about two to three minutes after the first attempt. And then another attempt is made after 10 minutes after this. If this still fails, then manual removal should be done. Then oxytocin may be given when you have crowning of the head with delivery of the anterior shoulder, like I said, or after the delivery of the placenta. Now, what are the advantages of active management? It minimizes blood loss in the third stage, approximately to one-fifth. It shortens the duration of the third stage of labor. 
What are some of the limitations? It increases the incidence of retained placenta in 10% and consequent increased incidence of manual removal. And sometimes accidental administration of oxytocin if you have a twin pregnancy, an undiagnosed twin pregnancy can actually cause a danger to the unborn child because they do suffer asphyxia because of the titanic contractions of the uterus and this can actually cause the child to die. So you should limit the use of oxytocin in twin deliveries until the second twin has been delivered. Methagen is also not going to be indicated for those that have cardiac conditions and things like severe preeclampsia as it can actually precipitate cardiac overload in patients that have cardiac conditions and it can actually even exacerbate blood pressure. Here's a summary of the three stages of labor. Stage 1, which has two phases, latent phase for effacement, active phase for rapid dilatation. So this begins with the onset of regular uterine contractions. It ends with the acceleration of the cervical dilatation, so which is pretty much at 4 centimeters dilated. So this prepares the cervix for dilatation. Then it's less than 20 hours in primiparous women, less than 14 hours in multiparous women. Then you have an active phase where there is a dilatation. This begins with acceleration of the dilatation it ends when these 10 centimeters or complete dilatation so in primiparous women it's more than 1.2 centimeters per hour in multiparous women is more than 1.5 centimeters per hour then you have stage two where there's descent it begins from 10 centimeters completely dilated it ends with delivery of the baby so there's descent of the fetus less than two hours in primiparous women less than one hour in multiparous women we should add one hour if there is an epidural that was used then stage three there is expulsion where it begins with delivery of the baby it ends with delivery of the placenta and it lasts less than 30 minutes then in stage four, this is a stage where there's observation at, at least one hour after expulsion of the afterbirths. And during this period, we actually should visit the mother and look at the vitals. We also check for the uterine contractions, check if there's any vaginal bleeding. This can be a time for the baby to be examined. And the pulse, the blood pressure, the tone of the uterus, if it's well retracted, and any other abnormal vaginal deliveries should be washed out for at least an hour after delivery. So when they have fully satisfied the general condition of be having a good pulse, good blood pressure, and the uterus is well contracted, there's no abnormal vaginal bleeding, they can be sent back to the wards. Here's a warm-up question. A 30-year-old G1 para-0 mother with a twin gestation at 25 weeks, so this is at 25 weeks, presents to labor and delivery complaining of irregular uterine contractions and back pain. She reports an increase in, amniot in the amount of vaginal discharge, okay, and denies any rupture of membranes. She reports that earlier in the day she had some very light vaginal bleeding, antepartum hemorrhage, which has now resolved. She says the babies have been active and have been moving as usual, so that's a good sign. She thinks that she may be feeling cramping because she may have had overdone it with too much activity, trying to lift as she's trying to fix up the necessary to get ready for the babies. She denies any changes in bowel or urine habits, okay. She reports having regular prenatal care during pregnancy and denies any problems or complications okay that's a good sign as well on arrival to labor and delivery she is placed on an external fetal monitor which indicates uterine contractions she may be actually going into labor every two to four minutes she is afebrile and her vital signs are normal her gravid uterus is non-tender so this may not be a placenta abruption but we can't rule out placenta previa because we haven't been given enough information so the nurse calls you to evaluate the patient all of the following are appropriate steps to evaluate this patient so do not perform a sterile digital examination this is rather obvious so that's the one thing that you wouldn't do you, you should give intravenous hydration you should perform a bedside ultrasound to locate the placenta and also the fetal heart rate and other parameters on ultrasound perform a urinalysis and urine culture a rectal swab for group b streptococcus so you shouldn't perform a sterile digital examination i really hope you enjoyed this lecture on labor i know it was very long but i promise that the subsequent lectures will be much shorter if you did consider subscribing to the channel hit the bell notification icon to be receiving such notifications of such videos every time i post to zambia and beyond my name is dr moses kazevu until next time Bye-bye.